Eric. Hey, Laura. You run. Hey, how are you? Doing well, thanks. <laughs> Excellent. So you run an Airbnb business um, largely um, with other people's properties. And I wanted to have you on the channel today to talk about your experience, how you got to where you are today, the lessons that you've learned along the way. And at the end of the video, I want to speak candidly about the biggest mistake you've made thus far in your Airbnb business okay. and how that can be a lesson for uh, everyone that is watching. So let's get started. Uh, let's talk awesome. about your, your, your business model and how you got to where you are today. Uh, awesome. Thank you again. First off to start, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm excited to be here with you and to chit chat and hopefully uh, my story can help some people on your channel. I, I spend a lot of time prior to getting into the Airbnb world myself, uh, kind of consuming media through YouTube. So excited to be here. Um, but yeah, my business model started, I, I actually got started back in 2019. And when I started, I started with a house hack. So I did own my first property. Um, and it was my basement apartment. And I decided we had long-term tenants in the basement and I had heard about this Airbnb thing and decided, Hey, why not give this a shot? Let's see if this will work for us. See if we can make some extra money doing it. And I started doing the whole comping process and the analytics and trying to see like, is this worth our investment? Because I'll be honest with you financially, I was not in the best place to be taking risks, but uh, I wanted to try it. And I, was doing my research and I found a neighbor who was actually uh, renting their basement apartment on Airbnb. So I went and had a conversation with him. Based on that conversation, I decided to move forward. And uh, that ended up being such a good financial decision for us that I was like, how can I get into more properties? But like I mentioned, I wasn't in the best financial position at the time. And I decided the best way for me to do that was to do what's called rental arbitrage. And I decided to start renting properties from other people out there like landlords. And I was very candid about what I was doing. In fact, my pitch was horrible at the beginning. It was like, I want to Airbnb your place, you know, like. <laughs> and they were like, yeah. Yeah, like, let's do this, right? Like, this is awesome. Yeah. My Airbnb is crushing it. Let me take your place and Airbnb it too. And uh, th that obviously did not go super, super well. And I finally mm -hmm. convinced the landlord to do it with me. And uh, long story short, that was kind of my, the start of my journey. And I, I did go slow and steady for a while, to be honest with you, Laura, in the sense of mm -hmm. uh, the first two years of operating, I, uh, I remember I, I signed my first arbitrage deal on February 15th, 2020. And that'll forever stick in my mind because March, 2020 stay at home orders were put in place. Mm. And so here I was super excited about how my business was doing from 2019, uh, how my basement apartment was doing and go get my first arbitrage agreement. I just signed a lease for uh, this condo. It was a three bed, two bath condo and feeling super excited about it. And we had listing the listing up within like two weeks of signing. And we had tons of bookings that came through and then all of a sudden stay at home orders were put in place and all of our bookings canceled, right? And I remember the month of March, we had nobody stay with us. In April, we had one guest who stayed with us and I thought this was it. I'd hosed my family, I'd screwed up. This is game over for us. Mm -hmm. And um, we were able to, to turn it around and we started kind of getting into the 30 day midterm rental market. And long story short, here I am a couple of years later. Uh, now we have 40 doors and most of that growth has actually come over the past year. So in January of 2023, we had six properties at that point in time. And as it stands of today, we're February 2024, right? Uh, mm -hmm. February 2024, we're at 40 properties. Wow. So we really kind of, I, I kind of put my head down and, and went to work, but the first mm -hmm. two years, three years of me doing this business, um, it was kind of just learning um, through that process. And then over the past years, when we really decided, <laughs> let's go for this and, and make this a full-time thing. Cool. 
Okay, so um, let's get into the, it sounds like the first lesson that you you learned in all of that. So you started out approaching landlords like, hey, let me put your place on Airbnb and that clearly didn't work, but you figured out a way um, to pitch landlords. Can you talk more about, um, you know, how, how you learned how to pitch properly and what that yeah. pitch now is? Yeah, um, so, you know, the old saying goes, practice makes perfect, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, for, for me, I got a lot of practice and I probably had something close to around 40 people who said no before I, I finally got my first yes. And uh, I, I have polished that a lot since that point in time. And I realized that one of the big mistakes that I was making was uh, just trying to be, how do I say this, like, to like, I just tell people like, Hey, I want to Airbnb your place rather than giving them any kind of value or benefits as to why they should allow me to rent their space in comparison to a typical long-term uh, tenant. Um, we have to provide that value to a potential landlord or somebody who's going to lease that property to you. So that was one of the big changes that I started making as I started getting better at what I was doing. So in my portfolio today, right, we have 40 properties, 14 of our properties are arbitrage, meaning that we do lease those and then <clears throat> sublease those back out. And so we just got better at it in the sense of, Hey, uh, you know, Laura, I love your place. I'm so excited to be able to speak with you today. I'm probably one of the weirdest phone calls you'll probably get in in terms of renting your space, but I'm a bit different than most other tenants out there. And I know that this is going to sound odd, but I would love to rent your place, furnish it and take care of it professionally so that we can actually turn around and lease that back out to others. Is that something that you would be interested in at all, right? And so I'm kind of cutting to the chase. I'm, I'm, I'm getting there, but I've changed my pitch from saying things like specific Airbnb or VRBO. And obviously that question does come up. People ask me, so are you going to put this on Airbnb? Are you going to put it on VRBO? Mm -hmm. And the answer is always yes, right? We're 100% <laughs> candid about what we do and how we do it. But the, the process of like getting in the door you want to come across very professional and, and making them feel like, hey, we're professionals at what we do. We want to take care of your space and we're going to be the best tenants that you've ever had. And there's a lot of value. In fact, I could probably talk for hours to you about how to do this whole process. But mm -hmm. to simplify things, I just got better at providing more value to my landlords. Got it. Okay. So um, I'd love to hear before we sort of get on to like the, the next thing you've learned, I would love to hear what have been some of the questions, concerns, any other pushback that you've gotten from landlords about this particular strategy? Because I'm sure people viewing yeah. this is the hardest part. It is. Um, and, and you're going to get a lot of reject. You said you got 40 no's before you got your it first. Was, yes. It was probably close to 40. It was between, wow. you know. 35 to 40 no's. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of that had to do with, uh, um, you know, when, when I'm, when I'm helping people or they're, they're asking for advice, uh, when I was first starting in this business, there was a lot of gurus out there. Right. And a lot of people who talk about like how they did it. And mm -hmm. there's a lot, there was a lot of shady players in the space and they were talking about like, well, you just need to get the meeting with the landlord. And when you get the meeting with the landlord, that's when you pitch them when you're in person. Right. So, when I was doing a lot of these initial walkthroughs with people, I was just saying, hey, I'm a tenant. I'm interested in your place. Can I come see it? And then I'd show up and then they'd get upset because I wasted their time. Mm -hmm. And so now it, we got to the point where it was like, okay, I'm cutting to the chase and I want to make sure that I'm yeah. saying it from the very beginning on the phone so that they know what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. And um that that helps significantly in being able to overcome a lot of those to get from no to yes, right? Okay. Okay. So um, it sounds like, you know, trying to be sneaky about it or saying, you know, when they meet me and like me, they'll say yes. Like none of that really that, works. No, no that, is, that does not work. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> take, it, take it from somebody who did it way too much at the beginning thinking mm -hmm. that I had to meet the person in person to mm -hmm. pitch them. 
No, if, if you respect people's time and um, you, you let them know, hey, this is what I'm doing and this is what I'm planning to do with your space, okay. they'll be a lot more receptive. And uh, the other thing that I really learned when I was doing a lot of my phone calls and even to this day is I always try to find people who are um, smaller landlords. Mm. I, I prefer working with your mom and pop landlord. Right. Okay. Um, so I have 14 arbitrage units mm -hmm. uh, of those 14 arbitrage units. I have uh, 10 different landlords. So I have one landlord who has four. Right. But um, mm -hmm. I have 10 different landlords and they're all wonderful, amazing people. Mm -hmm. And the big reason why I prefer working with them is because when you get to the negotiation table, and you're discussing with them about like what your goals are and what you're plan trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, you're able to really hash that out. And I think a lot of the objections that you, you brought that up, like what kind of objections are you running into? You know, you run into a lot of objections of like, are you going to be able to pay the rent? You know, mm -hmm. what happens, what happens in the event that you can't pay me or you have a bad month? Mm -hmm. uh, what happens in the event that damages occur? What happens in the event that, um, all of a sudden there's a fire or some kind of issue insurance related, right? Mm -hmm. um, we get a lot of kickback on what kind of repairs or maintenance is going to be done and whose responsibility is that? Mm -hmm. And so as we started getting those objections, I found that it was much easier for us to work with individual landlords mm -hmm. than it was to try and work with a property management group or work with a, an apartment complex even, right? Mm -hmm. None of my arbitrage properties are apartments, which is actually pretty rare um, in the world of arbitrage. Most people <laughs> go out and arbitrage apartments. Uh, mm -hmm. I've never arbitraged an apartment before. Wow, so you just, you do homes? I do either homes or townhomes, uh, and mm -hmm. we do have some condos, right? Which mm -hmm. are, feel kind of like an apartment. Um, mm -hmm. My smallest condo is a three bed, two and a half bath. And they're usually, you know, 12 to 1300 square feet. But mm -hmm. the difference being is it is owner owned, right? It is mm -hmm. owner owned. It's, it's not an apartment complex. It's a yep. condo complex and it just kind of gives a different vibe and feel. Yeah. So you have more flexibility uh, as well. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, one, just be upfront with the the owner about what it is you're you're planning on doing and the value they're going to get from that relationship um and then consider going to individual people who own their home yeah. or condo or town home rather than these large apartment complexes um yeah. okay so now as i understand it arbitrage is only part of your business model right so you also do property management or co-hosting um Correct. So what's that like? What have been your lessons learned there? Because it's it. Um, well, I'm, I'm gonna let you answer that. What have been your lessons learned there in that model? Um, so co-hosting and property management are a very different model than than arbitrage, right? Um, because at that point in time, you now have some somebody else who who can have input or has some decision making capabilities with you. Whereas, you know, in, a, in an arbitrage situation, it was me coming to the landlord and saying, hey, uh, you know, Mr. Landlord or Mrs. Landlord, here's the $2,000 that you want per month in rent. You're going to mm -hmm. get that rain or shine every single month. And I got to do everything, all the design ideas, all of the management, what supplies are going into it, every little nitty gritty detail. Mm -hmm. I got to pick those items and put those into my units. Now, obviously, there's a large capital expenditure that comes with that because mm -hmm. I'm having to come out of pocket on that. Whereas with a co-hosting or management model, um, a lot of these properties come to me either pre-furnished. And mm -hmm. so sometimes there are some pains with that in the sense of the types of systems that they have or the type of items that they have. Uh, I, I think a lot of people, when they were getting into Airbnb over the past couple of years, there was a big uptick in you just list your space and it yep. performs and it does well and you start making mm -hmm. money hand over foot, right? Mm -hmm. And um, 
now we've really changed and we've gotten into a market where you have to be design oriented and amenity oriented and really provide great service to your guests. Otherwise mm -hmm. it doesn't translate. You're not going to get those bookings. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we pick up some of these management or co-hosting properties and that's really a big pain point for us where we're having these discussions with these owners and saying, Hey, I'm sorry to tell you, but the Ikea furniture that you invested in isn't going to cut it for us, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The reason why you're not performing right now, it isn't a lack of location or a lack of amenities. It's a lack of your design point or your, mm -hmm. your furnishings that you have. And we've got to make some changes before we can take you on board. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I hear you on that. I have, I have my own experience co-hosting, but can you give like a brief overview of, of what is property managing an Airbnb and what is co-hosting an Airbnb? Like, are they the same? Are they different? Yeah, so absolutely. So there's, there are some key differences between property management and co-hosting. Um, so property management is typically going to require that you have a license in your jurisdiction. Most states are like that. Um, meaning that you're typically a full service property management group. You're mm -hmm. allowing for 30 plus day stays. You do leasing. There's some other regulations and stuff that happens with that. So I own a brokerage in the state of Utah, which allows me to operate as a broker there. Um, in other states where we're maybe, you know, in Houston or Tennessee or Hawaii, where we do some co-hosting, uh, we do co-hosting and, and really the biggest difference between property management and co-hosting is who is handling the money, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, with a lot of our Utah properties, we're the ones who are receiving those funds. We're receiving mm -hmm. the money directly from the guests. We're mm -hmm. keeping track of all of the accounting. And then at the end of each month, we're doing a remittance to the owners and to mm -hmm. ourselves. Whereas with the co-hosting model, you're typically taking some kind of split um, from the owner. So the owner's receiving all the money, they're receiving, they're responsible for the listing, the listing profile, different things like that. And you receive a, a, pro, a portion of those proceeds, mm -hmm. whether you're invoicing that on a monthly basis or Airbnb actually has a really cool feature where if you're set up as a co-host, you can set it up so that you just automatically get a split. Um, mm -hmm. when that happens. So that's kind okay. of the major key differences between management and co-hosting. Mm -hmm. So as you do get into the space, be aware of, of what kind of language are you using? Are you yep. using the proper terms and are you offering management services or are you offering co-hosting services? Yep. So look at your state laws and know, you know, if you're allowed to manage a property, if you don't have a license and if not, then you're going to have to do the co-hosting model. It sounds like the, the, the service is essentially the same. You're running the Airbnb business, but where the money flows is what the key difference is. And that that's uh, the legal issue. Yeah, yeah. That's the big legal issue for most people, right? Like uh, if, if I'm, if I'm now responsible for somebody's money, uh, mm -hmm. In most jurisdictions, they say, hey, we want to make sure you're vetted to do that, right? You're yep. vetted and, and you're actually a trustworthy person mm -hmm. to handle somebody else's money. So that's, yep. that's an important thing to know. Awesome. Yeah. And it sounds like, you know, in order to do that, you have to be a proper business. You probably can't do that as fly by night. You might need an LLC. You might need bookkeeping software. Um, and other systems in place so that you are a legitimate business um, and that you're not just some individual person, Correct. I would imagine. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And, and, awesome. and, you know, uh, in, in full transparency, I mean, that's a lot of how my work, my life works, right? I'm always mm -hmm. liking to be transparent, honest about things and experiences that I went through. But this is a lot of stuff that I learned as I was going, right? So I made those mistakes and I started, um, started doing some management for people and realized as I started digging into it and learning more about it, I was like, oh my gosh, I need to get licensed for this. I need to get a, a brokerage for this. I need to. So I, I understand that there are going to be situations out there where maybe you get started like arbitrage doesn't require a license, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's something that I could just get into. I was able to rent the property and because I'm essentially renting the property, I can host and manage it for myself, no issue. And mm -hmm. that's how I really started my business. And then it kind of evolved into this management piece. And as I started taking on clients, I started having to educate myself mm 
mm-hmm. on what I needed to do and what I needed to change in my business to make sure I'm, I'm not only protecting myself, but I'm also protecting my clients and uh, our, our business. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And I don't want to quite get to the, you know, like your biggest mistake yet. So we'll hold off for a second because we actually have a question um, from someone in the audience watching. Awesome. Um, and I'm going to phrase it a little bit differently because I'm not sure that you would know this information. They're asking about like, what are the co-hosting friendly states? But um, to bring it up a level, where would someone find out that information about whether they need a license to be a property manager? Where would they go? Yeah, so a lot of that information can be found on your local real estate. So a lot of places are part of what it's called the MLS, the multiple listing service. And a lot of places will have a realtor network. Um, That is a great place for you to start. And if you're interested in understanding or learning how that works, take the time to actually call some brokerages. Uh, That might be something like a a Keller Williams or Exit Mm -hmm. Realty or Century 21. Some of these bigger names that you're you're familiar with, Berkshire Hathaway, and just call them and say, hey, I'm interested in learning how to do property management. Do you know if we need to get a license for that? And Mm -hmm. they'll tell you and they'll tell you how to to get that license. They'll tell you... um, how it all works, the kind of hours that need to be put into it, um, and how to go through that process with your state, because each state does have a slightly different process. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the key thing here is, is a lot of brokerages will give you that information for free, and they'll help you get through that process because brokerages take a cut. Right. Right. Which is why I own my own brokerage. <laughs> mm, so gotcha. um, they're going to take a cut if, if you're going to be doing property, like full fledged property management. Whereas with co hosting, they don't have to because, again, it's where the money flows. Mm-hmm. So with co hosting, you're able to allow your owners to receive that money, not have a brokerage or somebody kind of licensed overseeing your efforts. Um, mm-hmm. and, and to answer that question about what states are co hosting friendly. I have yet to run into a state that is not co-hosting friendly. Um, Most states are. uh, Again, I'm not in all markets, right? The markets Mm -hmm. that I'm in right now uh, primarily is Utah uh, and then Tennessee, Arizona. Uh, We we just launched a co-hosting one in Houston, Texas, and then we have two in Hawaii as well. So depending on your state, uh, you know, obviously you want to make sure you play within the, the, the rules especially Mm -hmm. especially once you start getting to a level where it's like okay now i have five six seven eight ten twenty thirty forty doors Uh, you don't want to have that gamble of somebody being able to destroy your business overnight yeah absolutely um so for those of you watching who are uh interested in like so how do you set up a co-host let's say you got a property the easiest way to do it is when you set up the Airbnb listing, you can say um, uh, which account, which bank account the money will flow into. You would just include the um, the owner's account in that information and then the money will go to them and then they will remit a check to you every single month. So that's yeah, pretty simple. That's, that's the easiest way to do it, guys, is yep. it, Airbnb is, is really slick. I love mm-hmm. Airbnb software. Uh, I'm a big fanboy of Airbnb. I'm not going to lie, um, but <laughs> like Airbnb software and what they do and the tools that they provide you are phenomenal. And yeah. so as you start getting into the business, you'll see that that co-hosting piece. It's it's very easy to set up on the platform. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, Airbnb has its challenges that we won't go into here, but I think that there are a lot of <laughs> positives of Airbnb and the software yeah. that people aren't thinking about. For example, you know, if you run your own direct booking website, right, you've got a website and you have all of your properties listed there and people can book directly through that. Guess what you have to do? You have to create a vendor account where people can pay you. And guess what happens? You get charged a percentage of the fee to process the credit card. Um, You don't have to do that with Airbnb and Verbo. That's part of the benefit that you get. Um, so, you know, there are just things about running a business that these online, uh, travel agencies take care of for you. That is part of the fee that they charge. And I think not a lot of people know about that. And it, it's, it's important information to keep in mind. I a hundred percent agree with that. And I, I think he said it perfectly. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, what has been your biggest mistake so far in your business and what lessons can be learned from that? Oh, man, I've made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> Uh, lots and lots of mistakes over the years, right? Um, but I think honestly, from like retrospect, looking back at everything, the biggest mistake I made was not getting mentorship, hmm. not getting somebody who's done this already to help me out, right? And and mentorship doesn't have to be direct, right? Like. I think a lot of people hear me say that and they're like, oh, well, so like, do I need to go get a coach or something? And I'm not talking about that, right? What you're doing right now, watching YouTube is a form of mentorship. And I think being able to gather that information and get that data is so crucial. And I made so many mistakes where um, we have people in our lives that have already made those mistakes and they're willing to share how to avoid those pitfalls. I think of like one of my mentors who's also one of Laura's and that's Rob Alasolo. And he has an amazing YouTube channel with, I don't know how many videos now mm -hmm. of information out there, right? And there's a, a lot of other people that I follow and coaching programs that I'm a part of so that I can improve myself. And I wish I would have started doing that sooner in my journey mm -hmm. instead of later, right? I yep. really started doing that um, probably about three years, almost three years into my journey. And I'll, I'll tell you right now that when I started doing that is when I started to experience that hyper growth stage is when I started taking my business from a side business or a side hustle to an actual legitimate business and a full-time income for myself. Yep. So where can people reach out to you for mentorship? Oh, that's a great question. So um, uh, I am a coach for Rob Solo as well, because uh, that worked out great for me when I joined his program. Um, so Rob is a great place for me to connect with you through Host Camp. If you have ever looked into Host Camp or joined there, uh, I do have an Instagram. I'm horrible at checking it, but you can DM me. <laughs> Uh, Eric.Delgado. And then the other piece is, is Facebook. I love Facebook. I love Messenger. So uh, shoot me a message through Messenger. I, I'm happy to connect with you and, and help you guys out as best I can. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining today, Eric. It's been great learning from you. You dropped some amazing gems. If you want to be an Airbnb host, click the link down below. You can earn $40 after hosting your first guest. And I've got all of my links to furnish and decorate your Airbnb like a pro. Thank you all so much for watching. Bye-bye. Thanks, Laura. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.